Praise the Lord. Uh, hallelujah. It looks like you are just waking up. I said, Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the revelation. And we know that the word, the revelation, is supposed to wake us up, turn us around, and make us face the ministry, the calling you have given us. Lord, I pray. Anything that will hinder us, come between us and the fulfillment of the great commission you have given. I pray that you take it from every life, every family, every minister in Jesus' name. Impact every life today and help us, Lord, to be doers of the word and that the work of God will prosper in our hands. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless everyone. Please be seated. We appreciate you coming early for such a session like this. The book we're looking at, which is the book of Jonah, a prophet of God, sent by God, called by God, commissioned by God, and then uh, he himself uh, will want to see his reaction or response to that call. So we can learn, because the Bible says all these things are written for our learning. Or for us who have come at the end of the age, end of the world. And today we're looking, we're still coming back to chapter 1. And we're looking at chapter 1, reading from verse 2, Jonah chapter 1, reading from verse 2. Here is what the Lord said unto him, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. And then in verse 3, it says in verse 3, But Jonah rose up. The Lord said, Arise, and he rose up. But the word that uh, comes before that is the word but. Which means, the Lord said, go this way, but she went the other way. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tashish from the presence of the Lord and went down. Anytime we go away from the plan of God, the presence of God, the purpose of God, the calling of God, we go down. It might appear we're moving forward, but we're going down. Anytime we reject, anytime we receive what the Lord has called us to do, will be going down. It said he went down to Joppa and he found a sheep going to Tashish. That's not the way and that's not the place the Lord has called him to. But he found something that would transport him and take him to the place opposite where God had called him. So he paid the fare, he paid the price thereof and went down into it, went down into it. And to go with them to Tashish from the presence of the Lord. It was going from something concrete and tangible. It was going into nothingness. It was to go with them. Jonah, where are you going now? Where is your life headed now? No purpose, no plan, no work, nothing to achieve for the Lord. In verse 4, in verse 4 it says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. The Lord actually sent the wind so as to rescue him from the life of nothingness. Let's look at our lives when we're pursuing nothing, when we're doing nothing, when we're spending our energy for nothing, and when we're spending all our skill and everything we've got, when we're spending that for nothing, when we're spending our training for nothing, then to rescue us from nothingness and to rescue us from a life that is wasted and useless, God saying something might be a wind, he might allow a problem, he might allow something that will jerk us up and jolt us and make us to think, where am I? What am I doing? Why am I here? So, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the sheep was like to be broken. And then he was told in verse 13, verse 13 says, nevertheless, the men rode, that's the sailors, the sheep men, and they rode hard to bring it to the land. But 
they could not. But they could not. They were trying their best to walk against the wind of God, the storm that God had sent. What was to arrest Jonah? They, they didn't want him arrested. They didn't want him to stop in his journey of into, into, into nothingness. And so, but he could not. For the sea roared and was tempestuous against them. And then in verse 15, we're told so. They took off Jonah and cast him up forth into the sea, and the sea sees from her region, and the sea stopped the region. There was a great calm. This morning, we're looking at an important subject, release from avoidable earthly suffering. If in my life, I could avoid all this suffering, all this storm, all this strife, all the things that come, that disturb the mind, that stop our journey. If I could arrest that, if all that could stop, what could I achieve in life? If in your life, all the suffering that comes, the sicknesses that come, diseases that come, the pain that come, the loss that comes, all those things, if we could avoid them, if every day could be free, if every week could be free, if life could be free from unnecessary problem, avoidable problem, what could we achieve? That's why we're here this morning, release from avoidable earthly suffering. Any suffering we have today that will hinder us from achieving what the Lord has called us to, this is your day. I said, this is your day. The Lord will release you totally in Jesus' name. Let's notice something about the character of God. In Lamentation chapter 3, I'm reading there from verse 32, we're learning something from the character of God. But though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Though he caused grief, or pain, or storm. He does that for a purpose, and it will not go a minute beyond fulfilling his purpose. Though he, the almighty God, cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Look at verse 33. In verse 33, for he does not afflict willingly. He does not scourge willingly. He does not trace up his storm willingly. He does not cause man or woman, any minister, any church worker, he does not cause the affliction willingly, for he does not cause affliction willingly, nor grieve the children of men. That's not his nature. That's not his character. Verse 37, in verse 37, who is he that says, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth each not. What can Satan do if God has not permitted that? And what can enemies do if God has not permitted that? Who is he on earth, in the sky, in the sea? Who is he in the forest? Who is he among the powers that be? Who is he that says, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not? I look at my life and I say, this is happening. God must know something about this. Is there something the Lord is trying to get my attention about and I didn't listen? And so unwillingly, without his wanting to do it, he has to send this. And then if I listen and I say, God, I get the point. I get the point. I know the reason why. And I corrected that suffering will be over. In your life, suffering will be over. In your family, suffering will be over. That thing is avoidable. And we're going to avoid unnecessary suffering in our lives in Jesus' name. There are three things we're looking at today. Number one, the recognition of avoidable <clears throat> the recognition of avoidable suffering in life. Number two, the remembrance of avoidable storms 
and loss. And then number three, the release from avoidable scourge by the Lord. Let's come to number one. Number one, the recognition of avoidable suffering in life. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 17. In Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 17, as thou not procured this unto thyself, Jonah, have you not procured this on thy, unto thyself, sleeping prophet? Have you not procured this unto thyself, prodigal prophet? Have you not procured this unto yourself, being a person in the wrong place at the wrong time and going and facing the wrong thing? At the wrong time, have you not procured this unto thyself, in that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, when he led thee by the way, when it was very clear, and when he was pointed, and he says, there's a direction to go, and then you went the other direction, is this not of your own making? Is this suffering necessary? Is this storm necessary? For Jonah, it wasn't. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, thine own wickedness shall correct thee. Thine own wickedness, thine own evil, thine own running away from God, thine own running away from the presence of the Lord shall correct thee. Thy backslidings shall reprove thee. That was the problem with Jonah. That's the problem with many people. The people that know the word of God, the will of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God, and in the face, the other direction, it says that backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil sin and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in thee, says the Lord God of hosts. Let, let's divide this to three parts very quickly. Number one, the self-imposed suffering of Jonah and the sale of self-imposed. It was something that they imposed upon themselves. Number two, the self-induced suffering for joining with sinners. They saw Jonah, and Jonah was running away from God, running away from the walk and the will and the word of God, and they joined themselves with him, and because of that, a storm came, and when the storm came, it came on the sea, and they were on the sea, and the storm came, the suffering came for everyone. It was self-induced. Number three, the self-inflicted suffering of justifiers of the stiff neck. Jonah was stiff neck, and he justified him, and he joined him, and they carried him, and they gave him all they could give him to go the opposite direction of God. They were justifying the stiff neck. And even when he told them, and he said, I'm a servant of God, I'm a prophet of the Lord, the God that made the heavens and the earth. And what I'm do you know what I'm doing? I'm running away from the presence of God. Even when they knew that, they still continued to try their best best actually there was so that they can help the man to keep on running away from God and the suffering they had was self-inflicted look at those three things number one self-imposed number two self-induced and number three self-inflicted I, I should be asking myself anytime there is problem you know every time there's a problem we rush to God we say Satan I bind Satan I bind the devil and there is only not have one. Hold on, hold on. Check up first. Is this self-imposed? People have done. You know what they shouldn't have done. Is this self-imposed? And circumstances in life, they're coming hard and heavy on you. Is this self-induced? And all the things that are contrary, and it makes life impossible to live, and you, don't, you can't find your way, you want to ask yourself, is this self-inflicted? And when we find out, then we're able to know where the problem is coming from. Where? 
began to have the diagnosis of what the problem is, of what the sickness is, of what the storm is, it is from that diagnosis we'll be able to provide the prescription and we'll be able to have the solution. Look at number one there. Number one, the self-imposed suffering of Jonah and the sailors. We've read already Jonah chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, and that's what he's saying there. What was he doing? He was uh, trying to do the impossible. He was trying to run away from God. In Jeremiah chapter 23, and we're looking at verse 24, it says, Can any hide himself any? Anyone that is so worldly wise, Anyone that has the subtle deception of the devil in the heart, can anyone, whatever he knows, wherever he's coming from, wherever he's trying to get to, can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do not I feel heaven and earth, says the Lord. He is everywhere. How can we run away from him? How can we hide from him? That's what Jonah was trying to do. And if you're trying to do something, and you look back there, you look here, and as God seen me, he knows everything. He sees everything. There's no way you can go. There's nothing you can try. He knows everything. Even the thought of the heart. Even the plan you have in your mind. He knows everything. Can anyone run and hide in secret places that I, the almighty God that feels heaven and earth, that I will not know. He knows everything. But he still try to run from the presence of God. Look at uh, Psalm 107, and we're looking at verse 17. Psalm 107, reading from verse 17, it's uh, telling not to sit fools because of their transgression. Fools because of their transgression. The prodigal son that ran away from the father's house fools because of their transgression. Jonah that ran away from the presence of God fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Not because this is the will of God. Not because the suffering, the sickness, the disease is the will of God. No, it's not the problem of the wise. The wise will hear the word of God. And the wise will respond to the word of God. And the wise will walk in the way of the Lord that leads to life abundant and life successful. And life that is worth living but is the fool that forsakes the way of the Lord and becomes because of their transgression, because of their iniquities, they are afflicted. In verse 18, it tells us, their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. And the, the challenge is, when people get into those conditions, they have, been so, they have the mindset that it cannot happen to me. God cannot do this to me. But you know, if we become fools and we're running away from the presence of God, from the plan of God, and from the purpose of God, God has record. He knows why he created us. He knows what he wants us to accomplish. He knows where we ought to be at any particular time. If we become foolish and then we have a mind that is contrary to the mind of God, those things, those evil things can come because God wants to use that storm, that suffering, that sickness to bring us back to the path of rectitude. It says their soul abhorreth all manner of meat and be drawn near unto the gates of death. Understand? They get near to the gates of death because of their foolishness. It shouldn't have been. It's a self imposed suffering. We're coming to number two there. Number two there is a self induced suffering for joining with sinners. Already we know the story. Let's look at verse 5 of Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1, then the mariners were afraid and they cried every man unto his God and cast forth 
the wares that were in the ship into the sea so as to lighten each of them. But Jonah was gone down into uh, the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. It's like the disobedience and rebellion in the heart of Jonah uh, sedated him. It was like it was like sleeping pill, and that thing already got into the brain. I'm sure you know it's not the eyes that sleep. You know it's not just the body that sleeps in the brain. The effect of those pills, sleeping pills that people take, and then push them to sleep. And of course, you know that those uh, pills they have the side effect. The side effect. When you take uh, those sleeping pills, it might put you to sleep. It might appear you've got your way and your body is resting, but the side effect is there. And the disobedience of Jonah and the rebellion of Jonah had the side effect on him. The storm was raging. He was the only one in the ship that knew the Almighty God, that knew the power of the Almighty God. All the other people only knew their gods, their idols, and they couldn't really pray properly and have any solution. And the man that has the key, the key to heaven, and the key to the attention of God. He had been sedated, and now he was fast asleep. We're told in verse 11, in verse 11, it says, Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may become unto us? For the sea wrought and was very tempestuous. Then he says in verse 12, in verse 12, he said unto them, take me up, cast me forth into the sea. When we are following the path of rebellion and the path of disobedience, our thinking pattern is what? Our thinking pattern is not straight anymore. We cannot think correctly. We cannot think straight. We cannot analyze what's, uh, what's before us and what are we doing. The man could not tell now exactly what to do. He knew something. This storm is because of him. He knew something. If I were not in this ship, if I didn't come into your life, this would not be up. I know that very well. Okay, what's the solution now? Should I repent? He wasn't thinking of that. Should I plead with God? He wasn't thinking of that. Should I tell God like the prodigal son, prodigal prophet, prodigal daughter, I'm coming back? He wasn't thinking of that. He said, well, leave me with God and let me settle the journey. How are you going to settle that? If they throw you into the sea and then you drown and then you die, how do you settle with God? And do you know that you can only settle with God here on this earth? He wasn't thinking of the consequence of his action. When we've gone astray, and when we're no more prayerful, and when we're no more thoughtful, and when we're no more wise according to the wisdom of God, we do some dumb things. And we suggest some dumb things. Some things that will not work, and some things we shouldn't do, and we go from bad to worse. And so it said, it said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so that the sea may come unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Again, I want to remind us that this is self-induced. The suffering, self-induced because these sailors joined with the sinner. Look at um, Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 15 there. Hebrews chapter 12. We're looking at verse 15, looking diligently. Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, many be destroyed, many be devastated, many be totally off their ground. 
when one person has done an evil thing and he does not repent of that and he joins himself with other people, other people join with him. The sky that will fall will not fall on him alone, but will fall on people joining hands with him. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, it says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Let's come to number three here. Number three, we're looking at the self inflicted suffering of justifiers of the stiff neck the self-inflicted suffering oh, you know they say we just pity jonah and how can we abandon him like that he paid the fear he joined our company is in the sheep with us and, and the milk of human affection kept them to keep joining with him. They knew the truth now. They couldn't say they didn't know what Jonah was going through and why they were going through what they were all going through. Now they knew. But they said, now voluntarily, deliberately, openly, will now support him. He's part of us now. And we have to support him. There are times we pity the people who are fighting against God, who are going against the way of God and the will of God, and we say, oh, can we leave him alone? Yes, we understand. We understand this has happened and that has happened and this is happening. How can we abandon him? You can pray for him. You can tell him to his face, this is not right. You are running away from the presence of God. You just told us now that the same God made heaven and earth and the sea. And you are running away from such a great personality. They could have told him you are wrong. Now, they could have asked him, you are a prophet. If I came to you and I told you that I did this, did this against God. And because of that, I'm suffering. Jonah, the prophet, Talk to me. What would you tell me to do? Counsel me. Show me the way. Tell me the mind of God. If I had come to tell you that this self-imposed suffering is eating me up, what would you counsel me? My brother, my sister, fellow ministers, let us counsel ourselves. What I'm going through. And I know the path I took for going through this. And this thing, the pressure is unbearable. If another person was going through that, how would I counsel him? How would I tell him to solve the problem? And Jonah should have thought about that. But Jonah just said, well, I don't want to counsel myself. I don't want to think about what I would have done, what I would have done. Take me up, cast me forth into the sea so that the sea become unto you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. Let's look at verse 13. In verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard. Men, sailors, that's what you did in the past. You didn't yield any positive result. But that time you didn't know. Now you know. And after you have known, you're still doing the same dumb thing. Doesn't that happen to us? Before we knew the direction to go, this is what we were doing. It didn't bring any good result. We are rowing hard. We are doing everything hard. We are spending all our energy, all our training, all everything we have got. And the thing did not yield any result. And then somebody came and gave us an eye-opening revelation. And now we know that this is the reason why this is happening. Not only that... <clears throat> not only that he gave us eye opening revelation he also told us do this do this on the basis of the word of god everything will be all right and we abandon that revelation we abandon the counseling we abandon the instruction and we keep on doing exactly the same thing we've always done and somebody said if you keep on traveling on the same road you have always traveled in 
you'll get to the same destination. Ten years ago, this happened, and this is what you did. Did not bring any good result. Five years ago, this happened, and you did that same thing again. It didn't bring any good solution. This time now, time is going. You are 10 years older now than you were 10 years ago. And the same problem is still coming up and you're doing exactly the same thing. If it didn't work then, it's not going to work now. Is there nothing else to do? Is there no other way to go? Is there no other way to turn around and say, I did that before, that thing did not work. That thing stuck in my brain. As if there is nothing, no other knowledge on earth. Turn around and stop. Ask yourself, this thing is not working. What else can I do? And when we do the right thing, the Lord will solve our problem. The Lord will solve my problem. Today, the Lord will solve your problem in Jesus' name. But change direction. Change the road. Change the things you have been doing. And when that change comes, I believe things are going to be better in life and ministry. Let's look at Romans chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 28. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Here it tells us, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. That's why we suffer. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They did not like to retain the revelation of God in their knowledge. Jonah told them, here is what you'll do. According to the revelation of God, they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. That is not scientific uh -huh. that is not biological that is not historical that is not reasonable what god tells them to them he doesn't speak to a reason because it's a god whose thoughts are not our thoughts his mind is not our mind his way is not our way if he spoke to our mind it will blow up our mind he doesn't speak to our mind he speaks to our faith but they did not like to retain god in their knowledge god gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Those things which will not bring any solution. Look at verse 32. In verse 32, it says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. It's like life is just going on. And people who are just floating with the sea, like dead fish float with the sea, with the river. They're not thinking, and they're not saying, is this part taking me to the purpose of my creation, and the purpose of my redemption, and the purpose of my calling? I think there's time to stop, and time to think, and time to evaluate, and time to scrutinize, and to say, Life is going. This, it looks like I'm floating like a dead fish and I'm floating downstream. Then I stop and I say, God, tell me what to do. He'll tell you what to do. We're coming to number two now. Number two, remembrance of avoidable storms and loss. Rem remembrance of avoidable storm and loss. We're looking at Acts of the Apostle chapter 27, and we're reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 27, verse 18, and we've been exceedingly tossed with a tempest. The next day, they lightened the sheep. Look at verse 19. Verse 19 and the third day were cast out with our own hands, the tackling of the sheep. And then in verse 20, verse 20 tells us, and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. Then in verse 21, but after long abstinence, they could not even eat. Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me. Sirs, ye should have hearkened 
unto me. Your heart, family devotion. The watch was read. And the solution came to you in that family devotion, sir. You should have acted unto that instruction you had there. You had a personal devotion, and ahead of time, the Lord showed you in that thing you read, sir, sister. You should have hearkened unto the speaking, unto the speech of the Lord. Before you came to this storm, before you came to this suffering, the Lord showed you ahead of time that this is the consequence or corollary of what you're doing. You should have hearkened. And so Paul, the apostle, said, see the loss and see the things we've gone through. You should have hacked I told you that this should not be. We shouldn't take the journey at this time. Does the counselor listen to counseling? Do the teachers listen to teaching? Do the people who try to open the eyes of the blind, do they have their eyes open? We who are preaching to others, who are counseling others, who are telling others, this is the way to go. Do we listen when God sends somebody to us and he says, this is the way to go? Or are we just doing the same thing every way? every time without listening to anybody when last did you as a person listen to somebody else another preacher another counselor another teacher another instructor another guide when last did you listen to somebody and when last did you take a definite step so that all these things happening will come to an end and so paul the apostle said he should have hacked unto me and not to have loosed from creed and to have gained this harm and loss it said if you had hacking to me would have gained all this and all these things that we ourselves labored for and we ourselves put into the sheep now we're losing them and by ourselves we're throwing them away if you are losing all this loss will not be look at verse 22 in verse 22 and now now i exhort you i exhorted you before and you didn't listen he see where we are now now the lord has sent me again and i'm going to exhort you i'm going to counsel you i exhort you to be of good cheer but there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the sheep praise the lord i said praise the lord now, Paul the Apostle was a man of the Old Testament. He knew exactly what happened to Jonah is happening now. And the sheep is about to break up. We're about to lose our lives. But he did not follow the example of Jonah. He, didn't he did not jump out of the sheep to get into the sea. Whenever you read any story in the Old Testament or any part of the Bible, see whether the story is for you to copy in total or whether the story is just to show you the pitfall or the mistakes of the people who did those dumb things at that time. You cannot say this is in the Bible because it is in the Bible. This is what they did. That's what I'm going to do. What result did those people get when they did what they did? You will read the story with understanding. Paul, the apostle, knew the story of Jonah. He knew exactly the same situation where he and I, but I'm not running away from God. And this won't happen. And the sailors, if they had listened to me, they wouldn't have been doing this. And so he encouraged the people. He didn't jump into the sea. There are times you need to understand like that and analyze that story that you have read and say this is what they did and this is what I'm going to do the Lord give you understanding in Jesus name we're looking at three things here number one remember Solomon number two recall something number three recollect Saul number one Solomon 
Number two, Samson. And number three, we're looking at Saul. Number one, remember Saul's storm, uh, Solomon's storm and loss. Number two, recall Samson's subjection through loss. And number three, recollect Saul's spinelessness and loss. Number one. Number one is to remember Solomon's storm and laws. We're looking at First Kings chapter 11, reading from verse 14. First Kings chapter 11, verse 14. And the Lord stirred up an adversary against Solomon. What? Solomon was a favorite of God. Solomon was a person that pleased God. And God gave him a kind of promise and kind of provision that no other king ever had in the land of Israel. No other person had the kind of privilege that Solomon had. But now it's like the Lord stirred up an adversary against Solomon. Hadad the Edomite, he was of the king's siege in Edom. Now, why will God do that to a favorite man, to a special king, and to somebody that he had loved very much and he blessed him abundantly? Let's come back to verse 1 of that same chapter. Chapter 11, reading from verse 1. First King chapter 11 verse 1, but King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites and the Zidonians and the Ketites. There are some people that think they're so much in favor with God and then because of that they can do anything. They become, they feel untouchable. And they feel that it may happen to other people. With, they had special relationship with God, special covenant with God. And because of that special relationship with God, they think other people may not be able to do that and they will not go scot free, but they say them, they are the favorite prophet of God. They're the favorite uh, royalty with God. They're the favorite person with God. They're the favorite child with God. And so they take laws into their hands. And what the Lord has said that we should not do, and no one in Israel should do, they say, yes, I know that, but you need to understand, God deals with me as a favorite and God deals with me as a special person even though if any other person did that they'll get into trouble they think they can do that but don't you remember God is no respecter of persons it's not impartial it's not impartial in his love it's not impartial in his chastisement but King Solomon loved many strange women and then with other people. Look at verse 2 there. In verse 2, he tells us of the nations concerning which the Lord had said, the children of Israel, to the children of Israel, ye shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. You know, some people tell us I'm saved, and the way I was saved was spectacular. And they say not only that, I'm sanctified. I'm so sanctified that I know I can never turn back away from the Lord. They said, can I tell you, when the Holy Ghost came upon me like mighty torrent, it's very similar to what I've read about Charles G. Finney. It's very similar to what I've read about Kenneth Egan. And this is what happened. And they say because of that, they can do anything now. Not really. Not really. God does not work like that. That's what Solomon said. That's what he thought. Of the nations that God had said, they should not go into them. Solomon claimed unto these in love. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it tells us, and he had 700 wives. Solomon, you didn't learn that from, uh, from David, your father, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. 
I'm so wise, nobody can turn my mind away, not really. And I'm so established with God, nobody can turn my mind away, not really. It says so, it's wise, in the plural, turned away, he said, look at verse 4 there. In verse 4 it says, for it came to pass when Solomon was old. That's it. When Solomon was old, not only old in years, old in experience, old in his understanding, old and sluggish, old and ignorant, old and forgetful, old and backsliding, old and the conviction that was there earlier, that conviction became old. The understanding he had before, that understanding became old. And the earnestness that he had before, that earnestness became old. And the wisdom that he had before, that thing became old. Old people, if they are not reading their Bibles, old people, if they are not checking up what they had in the earlier years, old people, if they are not examining, re-examining their old convictions, they become old and forgetful. He became old and forgetful. He was forgetful of the warning that his father David had given unto him, my son Solomon, fear the Lord, follow the Lord, honor the Lord, cleave unto the Lord. If you seek him, he'll be found of you. If you forsake him, he'll forsake you forever and ever. The man is old now. And he couldn't remember the conviction of the earlier years. He couldn't remember the passion of the earlier years. He couldn't remember his devotion of earlier years. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after all that gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord is God as was the heart of David, his father. Number one, remember Solomon. Number two now, remember something, recall something's objection through laws. This is a man, or was a man, that the Lord had sent an angel to the mother. The mother was barren, you know the story, and said, you have a son, his name will be this, his nature will be that, and his character characteristics will be this. In Judges chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 3, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, behold now, Thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. In verse 5, verse 5 says, For lo, thou shalt conceive, and bear a son, and no so shall come on his head, for the child shall be Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, uh, let's understand uh, the mother denied herself. The angel said, you, the mother, you're going to give birth to deliverer. And so, deny yourself of this, of this, of that, too. Remember that something and a call, and the call is that you will deliver the nation of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Now, here we are. Something standing between two significant events. Number one, the past. The mother denied herself of wine of any other thing that the angel had said. If other people have denied themselves concerning you, before you got to the position you came to, always remember, this is what other people did. 
And if they deny themselves of that because of me, I should be able to do likewise and deny myself of what other people deny themselves of for my sake. Number two, look ahead and look forward. The reason why you came to the kingdom at such a time like this, into the ministry at such a time like this, into the field at such a time like this, is because you will deliver the whole nation, millions of people from the strong and the greatest of enemies they always had in our lives we always look back this is what other people did to get me to where I am and we should remember this is what I'm going to achieve if I remain faithful unto the Lord if we remember those two things always you wake up in the morning and look back that's the denial of other people and then look you look forward you're going to be a deliverer to the whole nation between those two considerations of the past and the future you'll be able to keep your head straight your mind straight your foot your vision straight everything will be straightened out but we know the story Samson uh, then went to this place and saw one woman and all that and uh, you know I love you you love me and he spoiled everything until the Philistines took him, you know the story, he lost his eyesight, he lost his sense, he lost the direction of life, he lost his authority and position, he lost the spirit of God, he said, I'll go out and shake myself like as at other times, and he wished not, he did not know that the spirit of the Lord at least these are people that think they are kind of unconquerable they are unstoppable and there's nothing in that could touch them but we'll see their story number one solomon number two something look at proverbs chapter seven in proverbs chapter seven i'm looking at verse 25 proverbs chapter seven we're reading from verse 25 let not thine heart decline to her ways. Look at that. It's not the fault of the eyes. The eyes go the direction the heart is going. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, and the eyes see, and the ears hear. And it says, those Delilahs, they have not all died out yet. There's a Delilah there, Delilah there, Delilah in that city, in that village. And it says, when you see them, let not your heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her path. In verse 26, it says, for she has cast down many wounded. What caught Solomon? And you are not as wise as Solomon. What caught Solomon? Go catch you, go catch me. It says, for she has cast down many wounded. What caught, what caught uh, something? Go catch you, go catch me. Because it says something was very powerful and mighty. And yet, that thing caught him, for she has cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men are mislain by her. Verse 27, in verse 27, a house is the way to hell. A house is very much in the middle of the broad way that goes to hell. And you pass through that house and you do something within that house which God, the God of heaven can see on the, on the other side of the journey is hell. A house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. May God deliver every one of us. If we're willing to be delivered, you know, sometimes the sailors are hooked with Jonah and they don't know they can continue the journey and make the journey without Jonah. Sometimes the heart of man is hooked with that woman that will lead them to hell. I pray whatever umbilical cord or whatever tie God, anybody has with something that will be destruction to your family, destruction to yourself, destruction to the meaning ministry, the Lord will cut it away from you in Jesus' name. Number one, Solomon. Number two, Samson. Number three, Saul. We're looking at this. Number three, now recollect Saul's spineless, spinelessness 
and Lord. Here is Saul. He tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 9. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from something from Samuel, God gave him another heart. A transformed heart, a change of heart, a better heart, a heart that is suited for what God has called him for. He gave him another heart, well called that being born again in the New Testament. God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. Because he had that other heart now, the Lord called him and sent him to go and do something. In chapter 13 of Paul Samuel, but he didn't do it well. God gave him another chance. Look at chapter 15, verse 9, verse 19. In chapter 15 of Paul Samuel, chapter 15, verse 19. Let's see, therefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, Samuel Samuel said, as the Lord has great delight in bunch offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hacking than the fat of rams. Verse 23, it says, for rebellion is at the scene of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. Saul knew here is the word of the Lord. It came through Samuel, but this is the word of the Lord. And he acted contrary to that. He acted contrary to the calling of God. He acted contrary to the will of God. He acted contrary to what the Lord had said he should do. And he said, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected thee from being king. Look at the consequences of that we cannot say that you know somebody can slap God so to say and then there's no consequence we can deny God and then there's no consequence and we can uh, we can abandon the calling of God the will of God and the pleasure of the Lord and then there is no consequence it says because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. This one is not because, you know, God originally did not actually want you to be the king. Not at all. Because of the rejection. Because of the rebellion. Because of the disobedience that you have rejected. What you know to be the mind of God. Because of that, he also has rejected you from being king. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, he tells us, and Saul said unto Samuel, I I have sinned. Why did you say that at the beginning? When you were confronted and when you were challenged, why didn't you say that at the beginning? Now, you know, at the late hour, the man is saying, I have, I have uh, sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, look at this, because, because, because I feared the people. I feared the people. Can I remind you, Saul, put a thousand people together. They're not equal to the creator of, of heaven and earth. Put a million people together. They're not up to the God of heaven. And if the God of heaven has sent you, this is what you do. And this is the direction to go. And then you say, because some people, you know, they were bullies. And because of that, I feared them. That's why I disobeyed God. Now, Saul, you are the king in the land. If you disobey the, those people, there's nothing they can do. Because one with God is in the majority. But the man said, I forgot God. I depreciated God. I rejected the word of God. I rejected his calling and revelation. He said, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Remember those three. Anytime you, you want to do something contrary to the mind of God, the calling of God, and the Lord has called you like he called Jonah, and then you are going the wrong direction. Remember Solomon, remember Saul, and remember Samson. And God give us wisdom in Jesus' name. 
Look at First Chronicles chapter 10. We're reading from verse 13. First Chronicles chapter 10. Reading from verse 13. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the watch of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. There are people, they, they want to, and their ministry to grow spontaneously and they want to expand here expand there and instead of relying on God relying on Christ relying on Calvary and what the Lord has done for us and whatever we need is uh, is come to give us abundant life abundant success instead of that they go to the you know cultic powers they go to for people that will give them sacrifice and they bury something somewhere and they think that will give them the success that God could not have given them. They want to do the work of God or Satan's power. They want to do the work that gets people to heaven with the powers that come from hell. How can that be? And so Saul, in wanting to go to the battle against the Philistines so as to protect the, the children of Israel, he went to a woman, the woman of Endor, having familiar spirit. And so Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the watch of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. Then in verse 14, it says, And he inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. We've seen number one, we've seen number three. Let's quickly, briefly go to number three now. Number three, release from avoidable scourge by the Lord. I pray the Lord himself will release us from every form of suffering. We, we've done some foolish things, some dumb things, some things we shouldn't have done, and we have self-imposed suffering, self-induced suffering, and self-inflicted suffering. And as we come back to the Lord, the Lord is able, and the Lord will remove the suffering in Jesus' name. We were looking at Psalm 107, and we're reading from verse 17. Psalm 107, and I'm reading from verse 17. It tells us in Psalm 107, verse 17, fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. In verse 18, it said, Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. In verse 19, it says, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them. They cried and he saved them. They prayed and he answered their prayer. They told God, O oh Lord, I didn't know this would happen. I didn't beg him for this. I wasn't ready for this kind of suffering. But I realized it's because of my foolishness, because of my backsliding, because of my becoming a prodigal. I didn't you know, prepare for this. They cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them out of their distresses. Then in verse 20, it says he sent his word he has sent the storm now he's going to send the word he sent the problem now he's going to send his power he sent the thing that brought them low and brought them down he's going to send them now that will bring them up he'll bring you up he sent his wonders unto you amen he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Release from avoidable scourge by the Lord. We're looking at three things here. Number one, forsake. Number two, follow. Number three, focus. Number one, forsake. Number one, forsake. There are things to say bye-bye to. That thing got me into trouble. Bye-bye. That thing brought a storm. Bye-bye. That thing brought sickness. Bye-bye. That thing brought, you know, you shouldn't have had that, but for the smoking. 
It shouldn't have had that, but for the drinking. It shouldn't have had that, but for going dangerously to dangerous places, those nightclubs. It shouldn't have had that, but because of your association with the people that are reckless in life. That's why that came, number one, forsake. Number two, follow. You follow the wrong way and you want the blessings of God in your life, now follow the right path. Number three, focus. You are here for a purpose. Focus. You are here in the kingdom for a purpose. Focus. You are here on the field of ministry. Focus. Number one, forsake the backsliding bondage of Jonah. Number two, follow the beckoning bridegroom, Jesus. And focus. Number three, believe and build like the just. We're coming to number one. Number one, forsake the backsliding bondage of Jonah. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 51, and I'm reading from verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 51, we're looking at verse 6. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not caught of in her iniquity, for this at the time of the Lord's vengeance, he will render unto her a recompense. The Lord is saying, you've been in the midst of Babylon and you've been acting like the Babylonians, eating like the Babylonians, drinking like the Babylonians, dressing like the Babylonians and planning everything you do, your projects like the Babylonians. He said, now that has brought trouble. Jonah, this is what has brought the trouble. Flee out of the midst east of Babylon. Look at verse 45. In verse 45 it says, my people, go ye out of the midst of her and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. Forsake, forsake. Abandon those things that have brought you into trouble, that brought your family into trouble. It says, abandon them, forsake them, flee out of them. Look at Hosea chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 3. Hosea chapter 8, verse 3. Israel has cast off the sin that is good. The yoke of the Lord, they cast it off. The restraint of the Lord, they cast it off. The call of the Lord, they cast it off. And the pleasure of the Lord, they cast it off. Israel has cast off the sin that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. The protection had been lifted and the guide had been taken away because they cast off the thing that is good. Look at verse 12. In verse 12 it says, I have reached to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. The Lord was so excited and he said, Jonah, I have an information for you. Jonah, I have instruction for you. Jonah, I have a calling for you. I'm so excited about this. I'm sending you somewhere. Come on, Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. Is that what you're excited about? Is that what you call a good thing? Yes, that's a great thing of my law that I want you to do. And then Jonah said, I'm not interested in that. I don't have your pleasure. I don't have your desire. I'm not excited in what you're excited in. And in any way, I have reached to him the great things of my law. But they were counted as a strange thing. You know, the best thing to do in life, see what God is excited about and be excited about that and see what God is interested in and be interested in that and see what God is passionate about and be passionate about that otherwise you'll be turning a deaf ear, you'll be turning your back on what excites God. I have reached to him the great things of my love but they were counted as a strange thing. I pray the Lord will turn our hearts back again to his will and his word and is calling again in Jesus' name. 
I thought somebody would say a good day. Amen. Amen. Number one is to forsake. Number two is to follow. Follow the beckoning bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us in John chapter 21, and I'm reading from verse 20 here. John chapter 21, we're looking at verse 20. Here is what is there is what Peter asking the Lord. He said, I've heard what you've said. I know where you want to send me to, but how about this other man? What to he do and the Lord said I've called you you are the one to take a personal decision you are the one to arise and go you are the one I spoke to and you are to do what I want you to rather than okay Lord I know that's what you are telling me about how about this man how about this woman how about that minister how about that minister face what the Lord has called you to and follow the Lord. In John chapter 21, reading from verse 20, it says, Then Peter turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he? Who is he that betrays thee? In verse 21, it says, Peter seeing him says unto Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? You know, we're, we're fond of that. Okay, I'm to do this. How about this man? I'm to repent. How about that woman? I'm to turn around. How about that brother? And I'm to now follow the way of the Lord. How about that person? And if I am to do this, how about deeper life? The one that is deeper than my about higher life? How about the greater life ministry? What are they going to do? Leave all that alone. That was what concerned Peter. And Peter said, Lord, what shall this man do? And then in verse 22, it says, Jesus says unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? My plan with other people, what is that to you? My project with other people, what is that to you? You are the one the Lord is speaking to. He said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. I will follow. You will follow in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three, focus, believe, and build like the just focus, focus. Now, you don't have uh, enough time to do, uh, you know, this and this and that. One thing is necessary. And Mary had chosen that good thing which shall not be taken away from her. And David said, one thing do I desire and that will I pursue after. And Paul the apostle said, uh, one thing, one thing, one thing. It says, I press towards the mark, and this one thing I do. You know, if your energy is scattered here and there, your mind scattered here and there, and your skills scattered here and there, and you throw yourself thin on the land, you'll not achieve much. Look at the rays of the sun. If you put a prism and all these rays of the sun, if they come together, on any material, it will burn a hole in that material. It's when you focus your time. It's when you focus your energy. It's when you focus all the things that you have just on that one thing. Can I tell you something? One thing, one thing, one person. Like, for example, if you look at Joshua, only one thing, one thing, and one man, he focused just on that man Moses, and if you look at him, David, focus on that man, just that man, Nathan. And if you, if you look at the people we see in the Bible, look at Timothy, focus on just that one man, Paul. And if you look at the project you have to do, this one thing I do. You wake up in the morning, this one thing I do. You're going through the day, this one thing I do. And you, you have other people, they do this, they do that, and you say, this one 
one thing I do. That's what you call focus. You believe focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's all in all for us. He's a savior. He's a sanctifier. He's a baptizer in the Holy Ghost. And he's the coming king. Focus on him. He's all that you need. And he's all that you want. Focus on one book. The Bible. The word of God. The, the precepts are there. The promises are there. The prophecies are there. The commandments are there. And the captain is there for us. And he's staring at us. And he said, this is the way I did it. Do it like that. That just one apostle of the Gentiles. Paul, the apostle, focus on that one personality. And there is only one path the Lord has for us. He says, follow that path. And there's one calling the Lord has given us. Just that one thing. And as we focus on that, the Lord will make you successful in ministry. If you have scattered all your energy and all your strength here and there, the Lord is calling you now. You have the call of God. Focus. You have the call of God. Believe you have the call of God. Build like the just, and the work of God will prosper in your hand. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm reading there from verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Look at verse 9. 10. In verse 10 it says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Focus and concentrate. Another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Then in verse 11 it says, For there is, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Let's focus and remain on what the Lord has given us to do, and you will succeed. I will succeed. And the work of God will prosper in your hands in Jesus' name. One thing, one thing, check up. What's the one thing, if you concentrated on that thing, you think about it, you plan for it, you pray about it, and you put all your skill, all your resources on that one thing, where will you be if Jesus tarried in one year, in five years, in ten years? You'll climb every mountain before you. You'll jump every hurdle before you. Let's remember Jonah and say, Jonah, bye-bye. We are going to follow the way, the will, and the word of God, and we will succeed. I will succeed. Sickness will vanish away. Storm will vanish away. Suffering will vanish away. And God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I'm looking at a conqueror there. I'm looking at an overcomer there. Where are you? Rise up and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. I know I will succeed in ministry. The Lord has called me and the Lord has appointed me. And this is what he wants done. It will be done. Right, so talk to the Lord. Everything you have heard, tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I am ready and I'm going to do the work you have called me to do. You forsake what needs to be forsaken and you follow the bridegroom, the Lord, and you focus. Everything you've got, you focus. You're about to prosper now. 